audio check. Hello, good morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Audio check. Good morning. Hello, welcome. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Test test one two. Good morning everyone. See you very shortly. Hello everyone, welcome, good afternoon. Welcome to Headcorn, where we are 
Plains TV. Here we are, live broadcasting an air show. It's where, where it should be. And what a wonderful venue it is too. Our first visit here, and we've got a really nice location actually, just set back slightly from uh, the crowd line, which you can sort of see behind me. Get my left and my right's correct. And runway behind me over there. Got the old man on camera down on the ground there, and I'm going to be shooting a bit of wide angle uh, today. Should have had an extra cameraman, but... Uh, uh, unfortunately tested positive for COVID uh, 24 hours ago so it's just the two of us so wish us luck bringing you all the flying action today Saturday and Sunday today's will go out on YouTube obviously you're watching it there now possibly Facebook possibly Twitter if the buttons I pressed 20 minutes ago have worked and um, welcome uh, thanks for tuning in and um, today as I say is a free to view live broadcast on those platforms but over the weekend Saturday and Sunday we will also be streaming but that will go out on our on-demand service at watch.planestv.com so a little bit of confusion there but we really like to give to do these free to view live broadcasts I'll, I'll be watching the chat on YouTube uh, during the day so if you do have any comments or uh, feedback for us or want to shout out do make sure to uh, head over to YouTube and join the chat there it's always really nice um, on these free to view broadcasts bringing like-minded people together in the in the chat for a conversation about air shows and aviation a little bit of bunking off from work today perhaps uh, watching planes TV and chatting with like-minded folk in the um, in chat on YouTube so yeah hop on there and uh, let me know if you've got any feedback etc but the on-demand service so that's the way that uh, I feed my kids so that's uh, planes TV, uh, TV on demand at watch.planestv.com I'll give you that title again um, that's where tomorrow's so Saturday's and Sunday's live streams will go out so uh, yeah, today we'll give you a bit of a taste of what we're all about and uh, the, the show's over the weekend available there. And I thought I'd set up a little coupon code. So if you're watching today's broadcast and you'd like to subscribe to that on-demand service, it's usually £10 a month. If you use the coupon code SPITFIRE, and this is just the first 10 people that use the coupon code SPITFIRE at watch.planestv.com, you'll get 20% off your first two months of subscription. And that... Obviously, I mean, if, you, if you've never watched a, a piece of Planes TV content before, who am I? What is that service? What are we all about? Well, we've been in existence for 30 years, set up by old, my old man who's somehow find him, found himself onto the microphone on the PA here. He does like to do that, promote his wares. Uh, it wouldn't take him too long to start trying to sell you a DVD, actually. But those days are gone. We're focused on that on-demand service now. And we've put our back catalogue on there and obviously new content like the live broadcast this weekend and indeed last weekend so we did ducks for last weekend and if you subscribe to that service now you'll also have access to air tattoo in just a few weeks we'll be live broadcasting the air display from there i shouldn't have gone all, i've gone very salesy very early haven't i sorry sorry everybody get my sales pitch out the way and we can focus on some aviation action in the very near future um, a little look at some of that content then that we've output recently this little bit of material from Duxford uh, just last weekend. We're going to see, uh, let me just make sure I've got you the right video there. It doesn't look like the right video. It looks like it's got a bit of a smoke trail, which, <laughs> okay, we'll see. We'll see what this is. But uh, from uh, Duxford last weekend, a little bit of the kind of content you get on the on-demand service. It just loves raw performance based on a Pitts S2S special.
This really has been a weekend when we've seen the richness of the British civilian display scene in particular, added to by some notable military contributions from our armed services. And this formation, representing some of the very best of the air display scene. And there's the break. Another unique formation down in the books for Duxford. sky left clear for one of those sights we always like to see in this part of Cambridgeshire. Sally B in a solo display, the only airworthy B-17 flying fortress left in Europe. Gorgeous sights of B-17, Sally B there, flying last weekend at Duxford. And we will see um, B-17, Sally B this weekend, flying with, in fact, I can see it in the, behind the camera, you won't be able to, uh, the case of the C-47. And that'll be uh, heading off to join up with her. In fact, I'll let me tell you what's going on today, shall I? And drag the running order out my pocket. So we'll see Sally B with the C-47 at around about 10 past two. But we are winding up now to flying starting in just a little while. That's the Red Arrows on in about 22 minutes. Um, they will uh, start as a their space until around about uh, 25 to uh, two. And then we have uh, a, a Stomp, Tiger, Moth, uh, Biplane, Balbo. Um, so a lot of the uh, descriptions on this running order are a little bit cryptic, but uh, it's going to be a, a real medley of uh, biplanes there at, after the Red Arrows, so don't don't head off after the Red Arrows. We have got a full afternoon of flying uh, heading our way, R right until actually nearly six o'clock. So leave us on in the background, won't you? So uh, Stomp, Tiger Moths, then C-47 and Sally B, Starlings, fantastic uh, two-ship aerobatic uh, display from them. Then we'll have a fighter from the BBMF. Uh, someone on the chat can no doubt tell me what we're expecting there. I think Spitfire. Then we have a C-47 display, and then a Bouchon stroke Spitz. How many? I'm not sure. And then Aero Legends combo. I'm still very close to the Aero Legends base, and they will no doubt put on a cracking show for a good 20 minutes from around about 4 o'clock with their aircraft, including Harvard's, and I imagine Spitfires as well. And then we have Wingwalk uh, just prior to 5 o'clock. And then Yak3U. Uh, have we got the yak on the ground? Oh yes, hidden way down there in uh, Ukrainian markings. Oh, that's a lovely lineup behind me there. I will show you. We, we, we're just building up here, guys. I will show you uh, more of the uh, atmosphere of uh, Headcon in the very, very shortly. Just give you a bit of a run through of what's happening. So yak at uh, five o'clock, and then Spitfire, Hurricane. It says nine ship plus on here. I think we'll see what happens there. Uh, but very much looking forward to a, a sky full of warbirds later on. 
They talked about Dakotas there or C-47s. And uh, another clip I wanted to, well, frankly, it's a clip I had sat on the uh, vision mixer downstairs and it w vaguely related to what was going on here this weekend, so I've dug it out. Uh, this is a little sequence from, gosh, let me think, it's Kemble, Cotswold Airport, way back when, I think around about 2013. And we're going to see a, a BBMF fighter today. Well, at, at Cotswold Airport that year, we had uh, Dakota flying with a single fighter, a bit of a different display uh, from the BBMF to what we'd normally see. Not not seeing much of the Dakota this year, I believe. Um, but yes, a nice little sequence, giving you again a little taste of some of the stuff available on that on-demand service. This is, uh, I'm not, not sure of the year, am I? Cotswold Airport, around about 2013. Again, someone in the chat will no doubt correct me. Memorial Flight were welcome visitors to the show this year, and they bought the DC-3 Dakota and a Spitfire, flown today by the officer commanding, squadron leader Ian Smith. Really pleased to see the site of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, who are just repositioning before running in to commence their display. Cameras out, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be the uh, display of the Solo Spitfire, the Mark V. Spitfire clears to the right hand side, entering also from your right hand side. This is the Douglas Dakota DC 3. Lovely sights and sounds there from uh, Kemble. Interesting camera position that air side. Not something we we often do or frankly choose to do, but uh, on that occasion went for it. Some interesting questions on the YouTube chat. Do join the chat on YouTube. They're a friendly bunch, and uh, it's a nice way of getting a bit of two-way communication between myself and and yourselves. I should say that. There's an extra commentator who knows a little bit more th than me about what's going on. 
and uh, frankly I'm much more comfortable behind a camera than in front of one so I will be cutting to those guys in just uh, a few minutes time got 15 minutes to go until we see how long have we got yeah around about 15 minutes God, bang on wasn't I uh, until the red arrows and um, a couple of nice comments on YouTube then who are now playing then uh, Wish was asking um, Wish was saying that Headcons, they're local and uh, how much they enjoy the aerodrome and it is an aerodrome uh, Me too, my first visit here a really really nice venue to nerd out slightly on uh, my work, video work the sun's in the right place, so the sun behind us whereas the, the likes of Duxford it's not so everything becomes a grey dot sadly but here it's behind us we're also quite intimate shall we say with the runway so quite dramatic uh, landing material available to us and uh, yeah I think that will be quite engaging uh, for an engaging spectacle from uh, from a viewer's point of view and certainly lots of fun for myself and Adrian to film so wish yeah we love it too and you were asking if we we're doing Eastbourne we are not and um, so that weekend I uh, expect to be doing a live broadcast from the Women's World Gliding uh, Championships um, up at Husband's Bosworth. Uh, the exact format of that and exa exactly what will happen, I'm not sure. But he's one, I'm afraid, is sadly one it's just not quite co commercially viable for us, um, sadly. Um, really want to see the show do well, get on very well with the guys there. Uh, wish the, I think there is a live broadcast going on, so a bit of competition for us there. Um, but hope, hope that all goes well for them. And someone else asking about Riat, Louise Harper, planes is Riat free with the subscription customers or separate fee on top? Well, I think it's, ex excuse me while I blow a fly off my glasses, I think it's exceptional value. It's available to you as an on-demand subscriber. SSE will be live broadcast. All, all of the flying displays on Friday, Saturday and Sunday will go through that on-demand service at watch.planestv.com. Put it back up. Um, the arrivals and departures will be free to view on YouTube. So, yeah, sub do subscribe to the on-demand service. But if you if you're just if you're going to the show and looking forward to a bit of the hype in the build-up to the show, you'll be able to watch those arrivals live on YouTube, free to view, and the show weekend available to all of the Planes TV on-demand subscribers at watch.planestv.com. And as I mentioned earlier, I've set up a cheeky little special offer for just today for the first ten of you that subscribe on the on-demand service using the coupon code SPITFIRE. The first 10 of you will get your first two months at 20% off. So normally 10 quid and it's going to be eight. I think pretty good value, Louise, for the entire weekend of, uh, of our tattoo action. I'm certainly hoping it's going to be very popular. Um, and yeah, it's the first time we'll have done the full... Crikey, that is bright. Sorry, I'm a little overexposed. Um, SSE this year, it will be the first time that we've live broadcast the arrivals and departures, and it's the first time we've brought it to our on-demand service, the free-to-view stream, that is, sorry, the live broadcast. Uh, at, on that on-demand service is our back catalogue of SSE stuff, so we've been uh, producing the official, official programme there since 2015, so there's a huge amount of stuff there, including the full live broadcast from 2019. But this year it will all go out on that service live. I hope that answers the question, Louise, and hasn't bored everyone else. Um, Luke asking, will React be live on YouTube? Heard you're doing a stream of React. Hopefully I've answered that at not too too long a length. And Jamie saying good morning. Good morning, Jamie. And Trucker Jake says he's had a chat with the Reds. They're going to be back up to nine next year. Well, we certainly hope so, don't we? Um, we're expecting them in. Let's bring my title back up so I can tell the time. Just 11 minutes time for the Red Arrows. It's probably a good cue for me to uh, get set up on camera, as I say, where, where I'd rather be. But do remember that uh, coupon code SPITFIRE at watch.planestv.com. Not least because that will give you access to this weekend's live broadcasts here from Headcorn. Saturday and Sunday both going out on that service. Right, I've done my sales pitch this morning, I think. Hopefully I've convinced one or two of you that we're worthwhile spending some money with, or hopefully by the end of the day we will love anyway. Got a good five or six hours of flying to look forward to. Closer to five, I think. Um, Adrian's looking anxiously at his phone, which either means he's, he's watching me live on YouTube and it's all working okay or it's not. I mentioned at the outset we were uh, we are a cameraman down, so uh, I'm holding a few more buttons than I'd like to be. 
But it's all good fun, isn't it? I'm, I'm where I want to be, folks. This is a, a lot of fun down here at Headcon. We've got a good, fo good weather forecast for the full three days. So expecting a full flying display. Right, I'll just have one last look at the chat. And then I'm going to probably hand over to um, the airshow commentators, kicking off, of course, with uh, the Red Arrow's official commentary. Just wish on there. No, good stuff. All right, well, maybe if we've got a few minutes, I think we are expecting. We've got some fast jet formation aerobatics uh, coming up for you in just a few minutes. Nine and a half with the red arrows. But we are, I think, expecting uh, the Stripe Masters over the weekend. I definitely saw them on a list at one point. If not, Stella Here's a little bit of uh, their display from Duxford just last weekend. Rolling out. And coming in for a crossing break. aircraft looked after by North Wales Military Aviation Services who are based at Harden Airport in Chester. They're a very proud Welsh company which maintains a range of light aircraft as well as ex-military fast jets such as these employing very many local professionals at their facility. Two aircraft in from right and left for a crossover. I'll be following that up with two more crossings in the carousel. Where do you think is a good spot for us to be? Uh, anywhere around here, really? Yeah. Just don't get in his way. No, we won't get in his way, that's fine. Just wherever you set up. So without further ado, we hand over to uh, Graham Muscat for the commentary for the opening show. It's the Red Arrows. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Headcom. My name is Squadron Leader Gray Muscat. I am Red 10, the team supervisor with the Royal Air Force yeah, Aerobatic Team, the Red, Red Arrows. It's absolutely fantastic to be here today. I know some of you were probably here last year and the team weren't able to get in with the weather. Um, today, the weather's looking pretty good, actually. So, unfortunately, we're only capped to a rolling display due to the airspace above us. But uh, looking at the weather, we should be able to get a rolling display in for you. My job today is primarily to do a supervisor display, but I'll also be uh, telling you a little bit of information about the Royal Air Force, some information about the team themselves. And also, I'll try and uh, let you hear some of the commentary via the radio and the microphone. As we're all well aware, COVID has had a massive impact on all these sorts of shows over the last couple of years. And it's fantastic for everybody to be out and about mingling once again and doing these shows. We have spent uh, May in Greece and Croatia perfecting our displays. We were out there for five weeks, uh, working up to PDA. Uh, and then eventually come back to the UK and display for you. We are back to the same levels as we were pre-COVID. We've now got 65 displays this year and over 50 in fly pass, which, as you can appreciate, is a very busy season for us. One of the key roles of Red Arrow is to represent the Royal Air Force, which, as a service, is on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. With our quick reaction typhoons, who are supporting NATO and also across the European continent. The job of the Typhoons is to protect and defend the airspace of the UK and our NATO partners should the need require if any intruder comes towards our airspace. The other role of Red Arrows is obviously to represent global Britain. 
and we literally fly the red, white, and blue across the world, supporting Global Britain in trade and industry. And in 2019, you may have seen the documentary where the team went across the United States and Canada. They spent three months in the United States and Canada, liaising with business and trade, again, promoting that Global Britain. And last year, we also displayed in Estonia and Poland, once again working alongside our NATO allies and aware, again, promoting Global Britain across the European continent. The Red Arrows and the Royal Air Force are also STEM ambassadors. That is science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we op often go to schools and colleges, working alongside those organizations, trying to get people involved in those subjects to address the national short shortage of people in that trade and industry. It is also important that the RAF and the Red Arrows continue to develop its own capability and adapt to the way the world is changing. And we will radically transform the way we are organized, the way we approach our training, our people, our bases, and the aircraft and equipment we operate. We are committed to the ambitious of target of delivering reduced emissions by 2025 and zero emissions by 2040, which is ahead of the UK national. With a large part of that is trying to obtain sustainable fuel for the aircraft in the Royal Air Force. The Red Arrows are proud to take the red, white, and blue across the world and the UK, showcasing the excellence of the RAF and represent the UK at home and overseas with a world-leading display of the best of global Britain. But of course, the Red Arrows is actually a military unit. We are, and as such, we are commanded by Wing Commander David Montenegro, who is a former team leader and former synchro leader and having flown the Tornado F3 and is a qualified flying instructor. Uh, I've just spoken to the team leader. They are inbound and they will be on time. So as I said, the Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team is a military unit commanded by Wing Commander David Montenegro. There are nine pilots on the team this year, seven in display, myself as Red 10 and the OC as Red 11. All of the pilots have flown operational aircraft, whether that be the Tornado F3, the GR4, the Typhoon or the Harrier or other aircraft that have been on exchange with foreign forces. All the pilots have a minimum of 1,500 hours fast jet and are assessed as above average to be able to join the team. Each of the pilots then go through a rigorous selection process where they apply and it is sifted down to nine pilots. That is then, those nine pilots then come out with us on our spring exercise out in Greece. They are sifted down to the final three and those three become the new pilots for the next year. But the Red Arrows is not just about the pilots. We have over 120 people on the squadron. Of them, over 100 of them are the, en the Blues. They are the engineers, the administrators, the support, the support personnel, PR, and log logisticians. These are called the Blues because they wear the blue overalls. And obviously, these are all generally people who have also served operationally. However, we also have people from who are just out of training. Of those blues, there are the 10 individuals known as circus. They are the lucky ones who are able to fly in the back of our aircraft between our displays. One individual that you'll see with me today is Circus 10, that's SAC Abigail Druitt. She is at the front filming the display and it's her job to film the display for safety and also for debrief purposes. She is also responsible for some of the tremendous airborne and ground images that you see across social media, having sat in the back of my aeroplane. The motto of the Red Arrows is a clat, and that means excellence. That means we try to do everything with the excellence in the back of our brains every single time we display or do anything. We also wear that we only wear the crest for generally uh, three years, and we try and pass it on to the next people. But ladies and gentlemen, get your cameras ready for the loud, colourful arrival in the wall formation 
Please put your hands together for the 2022 Royal Air Force Aerobatic Team, the Red Arrows. The colour goes off, the white stays on, and red one calls for the formation to change into seven arrow. You see the all seven aircraft moving in to form that distinctive seven arrow shape behind red one. Red one is squadron leader Tom Bold in his second year as the team leader. Having previously served as synchro leader, he has served as typhoon pilot on the front line and as a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II and the Takano, having also been the Takano display pilot in his previous career. Rolling out. Easing up. Smoke on. Go. And roll. The smoke comes on as the team roll to the left hand side. We see it on the right, Red 2, Flight Lieutenant Stu Roberts. This is his first year in the team, having previously flown Typhoon on 11 and 12 Squadron at RAF Coningsby. His opposite number on the left hand side is. Red 3, Flight Lieutenant Patrick Kershaw, known as Paddy. Paddy again in his first year as the team, having previously flown Tornado GR4 at Marum with 9 Bomber Squadron, and also Typhoon with 11 and 12 squadrons at RAF Coningsby. The smoke comes on as Reds 2, 3, 4 and 5 move back along the formation. The Red Arrows are based at RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire, which is the, was the home base of the famous Dambusters 617 squadron in the war. The Red Arrows, the Scampton will close at the end of 2022, and the Red Arrows will move to RAF Waddington, just to the south of Lincoln. In a tribute to the history of the station, its squadron and its personnel, and the fact that 617 now lives flying the new generation F-35, this is lightning. As the team come around to the left, on the far right-hand side is squadron leader John Bond, known as Bondy. He's in his fifth year as a team, having previously served as synchro leader, has flown Typhoon operationally, and is a qualified Takano instructor. Bondy would also like to give a shout out to his family here this day, his mum, dad, and his two nephews, Alfie and Frankie. Four and five smoke again as reds two, three, four and five move up the line to sit just behind red one. Go goes the call from Red 7 as Red 6 moves to the right-hand side and Red 7 moves to the left-hand side. Red 6 now sitting behind Red 2 and Red 7 sitting behind Red 3. All this while squadron leader Tom Bold is bringing the formation around to the right, making the move even more difficult for the Phoenix roll. Rolling. Out. Easing up. Go. And roll. As the formation rolls to the left, you can see the iconic shape of the Hawk aircraft. The Hawk first came into service in the Royal Air Force in 1976 and has been with the team since 1979. Since the end of March 2022, with the closure of 100 Squadron and the Royal Naval Hawk Squadrons, the Red Arrows are the sole operator of the Hawk T Mark I in the United Kingdom. Once again, Reds 4 and 5 smoke as they make their way back to the very far rear of the formation. The Royal Air Force is constantly trying to develop its capabilities and abilities within the military sphere. One of those capabilities identified is the importance of space. Space is important in the domains of air, land, sea and cyber domains in all military operations. To acknowledge the importance of space and those early missions of the 1960s with a shape that represents the lunar landing module, this is Apollo. Holding the bank now. 
Tom carefully bringing the formation around to the right to position themselves back down for the line. You see the formation start to change with reds six and seven moving up alongside reds two and three with reds four and five in trail on the rest of the formation. Get your cameras ready for the very colourful and dynamic and one of the favourite for the crowd and most technically hard to fly representing the combat aircraft no longer in service but was on operations for nearly 40 years. Head corn, get your cameras ready for tornado. Snow corn, go. Four and five. Robert, oh the board calls from squad near bond as reds four and five roll around the rest of the formation. Watch for the colour change as red one brings the formation around to the right. And reds four and five smoke red and blue. Red five is Flight Lieutenant Dave Simmons, known as Simo. Simo is a previous tornado pilot and has flown the, the Harrier and the F-5 while on exchange with the United States Marine Corps. You'll see the aircraft are flying with their air brakes out. This allows the aircraft to fly with a higher power setting, making the jet efflux a little bit hotter, therefore making the smoke a little bit more vivid. Two thousand twenty two is an important year for the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, as I'm sure you all saw on TV a couple of years ago. A couple of weekends ago, Her Majesty the Queen has celebrated her Platinum Jubilee. It was a great honour for the team to fly over London as part of that occasion. And to help celebrate and pay tribute to Her Majesty for her seventy years on the throne, making her the longest serving queen in history. Get your cameras ready for the colourful Jubilee present. As we come to the end of the first half of the show, you will have seen some graceful formation flying involving seven aircraft. Formation flying is a core skill for all military pilots, but I think you'll agree the Red Arrows take it to the next level with fantastic formation changes and some looping maneuvers. The formation will now split down into two sections. You have Reds 1 through 5. They are known as Enid. These are named after Enid Blyton's Famous five from the children's series books. And you have Red Six and Seven, who are the synchro pair, led by Red Six, which is the synchro leader. During the second half of the display, you will see the synchro pair heading towards each other with some fast, dynamic maneuvers. And the point of the second half is to show the agility of the Hawk aircraft and the skills of the pilots. Looking directly to your front, you'll see the nose lights of all seven aircraft with Enid sat on top and synchro just below. Get your cameras ready for the detonator. Red six and seven smoking red and blue break towards each other and turn towards their dairy pattern.
pull up to approximately 1,500 feet before they dive back down to approximately 1 to 200 feet with a closing speed of over 700 miles per hour. They will perform a series of barrel rolls before crossing, before again a series of barrel rolls in the double rolls. As the synchro pair leave the display area, look to your front right 45 and you'll see Enid now going into line astern. Red Ron bringing the formation around to the right hand side with the rest of the formation staying in line astern, concentrating solely on Red One in the helix. All the formation elements take their formation references off Red One and try to ignore any aircraft that are either to the left, right or ahead of them. Red one calls for leaders benefit as the even numbers go to the right hand side and the odd numbers go to the left hand side. Forming line abreast just behind red one. Once again, get your cameras ready, cameras ready as the colour comes on for the leaders benefit pass. As Enid leave this player, keep looking left and right for the synchro pair as they come back towards each other once again at that 1 to 200 feet and a closing speed of over 700 miles per hour. They will cross before a series of tight radius turns in the carousel. Red 6 coming round from our right to our left is squad leader Gregor Ogston. Gregor is in his fourth year on the team, having previously flown on Harriers and Typhoon operationally, as well as being a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk T Mark II. Red 7 working hard now to make that pass on Red 6 as they disappear back down the line. Keep looking to your left hand side, and you have Enid coming in from the left. Reds two and three smoke red and roll around reds four and five before reds four and five smoke blue and do the same. In one of the trickiest manoeuvres for our new pilots every year, this is the rollbacks. Yeah. Go. Keep looking to your right hand side with the synchro pair coming in with red seven on trail on red six. Smoke goes on. Six rolling in. Seven roll, go! Red six rolls inverted as red seven smokes the red, white, and blue around the smoke trail of red six. Red seven is Flight Lieutenant James Turner, known as JT. He's in the third year on the team, having previously flown Typhoon and is a qualified Hawk instructor. Headcorn gives Synchro Pair a round of applause. As the synchro pair now pulling hard round, pulling approximately 5G, that means everything about them is now weighing five terms heavier than what you and I are weighing right now. 
as Red Six brings the formation around to the left. The blue smoke comes on. Keep your eyes out to the right for Enid formation who have formed an inverted V. Red Six lining up with the Enid formation for the double goose and watch for the colour change. Power. A little bit right now. Each aircraft is fitted with a smoke pod. Each pod is capable of generating five minutes of white smoke, one minute of red smoke, and one minute of blue smoke. Therefore, each display is specially and carefully choreographed to ensure that we have the right color at the right smoke at the right time and that we don't run out. Look directly to your front, and once again, you'll see the synchro pair pulling up ahead of you. Okay. The red smoke comes on as the synchro pair peel away from each other for the synchro heart. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, give the Synchro Pair a round of applause for a magnificent red heart in the skies of Headcorn. Red 6 and 7 now turning back towards for their final pass at 1 to 200 feet and over 700 miles per hour. Performing a manoeuvre which was named by a viewer of the One Show in 2020. A series of barrel rolls before departing the display area inverted. This is Crossbow. Look directly to your front and you should be able to see the nose lights of the Enid formation smoking white. Red one starts to smoke red as he performs a series of barrel rolls around the rest of the formation in the infinity break. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure to perform for you today, especially as we couldn't get in last year, but please put your hands together for the 2022 Red Arrows. Red one puts on some white smoke as he gathers the rest of the formation to head back to the operating base of Farnber, which we're operating from today. If you'd like any... Uh, if you'd like any more information about the Red Arrows, I'll be around day for the next five to ten minutes. Uh, or you can look online, you can look on the internet, ref.mod.uk forward slash Red Arrows. We are on Twitter at RAF Red Arrows and Facebook, RAF Red Arrows. As I said, I'll be around for the next five to ten minutes. Uh, I have a limited edition uh, 2022. The new squadron print is available. It has been signed by all the pilots and it has the Queen's Platinum Jubilee seal on it. Uh, is available to me to buy. I'll walk along the line. If you want to buy one, then please just come and stop me. I hope you really enjoyed the show. Have a great rest of the day, and thanks very much for your support and attention. Squadron Leader Muscat, Red 10, what a wonderful commentary. Absolutely superb. And uh, there are some things in this country we do really well, and that's one of them. The Red Arrows, what a breathtaking display. Privileged to have them here for the 2022 Battle of Britain show here at Headcorn.
filling the skies with their coloured smoke and uh, precision flying. Absolute pleasure. Well, the next display will be at about uh, 25 minutes to, uh, to the hour. The Stomp Tiger biplane Balbo. There we are. They're just, they'll be warming up shortly. Don't forget, Squadron Leader Muscat will be coming along the crowd line. And uh, we'll be preparing for our next display. As the uh, Booker Jungmann taxes out, warms up for the next display, got a couple of shout, shout outs. Jamie and Nick from Maidstone. It's a happy birthday, Jamie. Nicky came up and told me that it's your birthday. You're here celebrating with us this afternoon at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain 2022 show. Jamie, have yourself a wonderful day with us, and I hope you enjoyed that uh, display by the Red Arrows. I'm sure Nicky would like to dedicate that to you. My next shout out is for uh, Paris Strong. If you're out there, Paris, and you can hear me. Just finished her GCSEs, and your family is very proud, as is Granddad. So well done, Paris. You can relax now and enjoy the summer. No more study. School's out until the next one. So good luck with your GCSE results from all the team here at Aero Legends. So next on the Fly Pro, we're going from the fast jet to the biplane era, a completely different transition, much slower, of course, representing training aircraft from the pre-Second pre World War years. And the Stomp and Tiger biplane Valvo will be just warming up, giving you a taste of what uh, the contrast is from today's modern jet aircraft that uh, Squadron Leader Muscat was describing earlier. And we'll go back in time with these old string bags, as they're sometimes called. So that's our next display, about 25 minutes to the hour.
have a lull in the proceedings. So, uh, Squadron Leader Muscat's just coming down the line with his beautiful prince. And uh, if you'd like to uh, buy one, have your £10 ready. He's coming down the line. And he's only got a limited number from what I can see. to uh, tell you that Nick Oram is with us today, aviation author and uh, author of Elizabeth and the Roaring Boys, a very well researched book about Spitfire NH341 and um, Nick is here today signing copies so if you'd like to chat to him he's a very knowledgeable chap about the Spitfire and he's in the Aero Legends building which is just alongside the air traffic control hut at uh, the end of the flight line. So if you fancy having a chat with Nick, he will uh, talk you through some of his research. He's a very interesting, knowledgeable chap. And uh, Elizabeth and the Roaring Boys, Nick Oram, is signing copies today. So that's in the Aero Legends hut. We've got a wonderful queue for the Red Arrows print. Uh, absolutely beautiful looking print that is. So let's hope that uh, Quadra Leader Muscat Sales plenty today. Tell about Stuart McGrath. Stuart, if you can hear me. <laughs> Apparently it's his birthday on Monday, but I'm sworn to secrecy as to how old he is, and I won't speculate. So happy birthday from your lovely, uh, your lovely wife, I assume, or partner, or whatever. Hey, well then you've got to be so careful these days, what you say. Uh, so it's a uh, happy birthday. Congratulations. Muscat's doing a roaring trade down here by the commentary position. They're going fast, these prints, so if you like to get one, come down to the, the black pop-up just at the end of the crowd line. You can't miss Quadrilita Muscat in his red suit. 
Goodness me, he's doing a brisk trade too. What about that? getting some aircraft airborne in position for the next part of our Battle of Britain 2022 Aero Legends display. So the display pilots are just uh, going to be holding off before they start getting into the right place for the display line. And, uh, our flying display committee are here making sure everything's done correctly and rightly so. So we're looking forward to that starting very shortly. You can see holding off just to the northeast of the aerodrome are the Booker Youngman, the Jackaroo, the de Havilland Jackaroo, and two Tiger Moth aircraft. A complete contrast from the Hawks of the Red Arrows with their high maneuvering fast turbine jets with their maneuvering display. Back in the 1930s, when the clouds of war were gathering across Europe. Aircraft designers thought it was time to get to the drawing board and these aircraft were principally trainers back in the uh, back in the day as they say for what we used to call ab initio training your beginning training the first aircraft that a World War II pilot would probably have flown would have been an aircraft like this the DH-82 Tiger Moth Roger Muscat's got about five more minutes if anybody else wants any more the prints there. Ten pounds cash only. The RAF don't take uh, credit cards. No credit cards. So five more minutes and he'll be up in his helicopter. The training aircraft you can see holding off to the northeast of the display line is the Booker Jungmann, the German version, the German trainer. The, very similar lines to the Tiger Moth and or the Stomp. 
all using much the same technology in those days. That was what was available at the time, including power plants, of course, the right engine to power these aircraft. And it's a little known fact that the Luftwaffe were customers of Rolls-Royce, buying the Gypsy Major engine right up until about 1938. reliably informed they're still formating and awaiting one more aircraft but we get a very good look what I like to call the sight and sound of an aeroplane and the way it maneuvers much much slower of course than a jet aircraft interestingly biplane one wing above the other it took a long while for designers to realize that actually an aeroplane would fly quite safely without the upper wing and of course the result was aircraft like the Hurricane and Spitfire low-wing aircraft only, but in those days these biplanes were considered the best way to design and build aircraft. I have flown both the Stomp and the uh, De Havilland Tiger Moth. The great sensation is the what they call the wind in the wires bracing wires that uh, hold the aeroplane together are tensioned and sometimes during a manoeuvre you can really feel and hear those wires as the wind uh, whistles through them. Very manoeuvrable aeroplane, what I would call very crisp in handling. It does exactly what it says on the tin, as they to use that old expression. And um, a good way of learning very basic handling. The lead aircraft there, the Jackaroo, was developed in the 1950s. It's simply a Tiger Moth with a cabin on the top, one extra seat. And the third uh, Tiger Moth you can see is probably the most representative of them all in its uh, RAF training uh, livery with the yellow underbelly. That's a sight you would have seen at many aerodromes in 1940-41 as our aircrew underwent basic training before selection. For further training, my father did his in 1940 at Shawbury on the Tiger Moth and were then selected for crew training and was sent to North America under the Arnold scheme to fly the Boeing Stearman, which we're going to see, and then the T-6 or Texan Harvard was a very popular training aircraft in North America and Canada and we're privileged to have all those with us today. So we'll get a sight and sound of the training aircraft that prepared the crews for the Battle of Britain and for bombing raids with Bomber Command, not to mention of course Coastal Command. Well they're touching down on the short runway, that's runway 21, about 600 metres usable, or less than that, no, about 250 metres, I think about quite a short runway, but short enough for the biplanes. And you can see the windsock is blowing down 21, giving a good headwind. Remember, the wind contains energy, and that energy helps us reduce the ground speed of the aeroplane as it comes into land. So pilots always prefer to land on the headwind, which may seem a little contrary to theory thinking, but that's how it works. About 230 metres that runway, if I'm not mistaken.
And the Booker Youngman is captain today by Richard Pickin, a very experienced aerobatic and commercial pilot, also an instructor. Started his training at Biggin Hill back in the 70s. In the days when Biggin Hill really was a hive of aviation activity, especially single engine and light aircraft. Let's have a look for his uh, his first manoeuvre, the avalanche. Very strong manoeuvrable aeroplane designed by Anders Andersen. First flew in 1934. A Swedish designer as a matter of interest. And a basic advanced trainer Excellent aerobatic uh, capabilities and was a favourite with student Luftwaffe fighter pilots as I mentioned earlier. They learnt their skills on the aircraft like this. history for you, the aircraft carries the Olympic roundels, which was applied to all Booker aircraft of the period to signify the Berlin Olympics of 1936, where for the very first time, the aerobatics was an Olympic discipline. How about that? Now this aircraft is kept in absolutely tip-top condition. It's an old aeroplane, requires a lot of attention to keep it flying. Spares are often difficult and expensive to attain, but uh, there's a team here that devote a lot of time to keeping these historic aircraft here working. We are privileged today at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain show to watch Richard Pickin put this book of Youngman through his paces. Now this particular uh, model that we're watching, interestingly, was constructed in Spain in 1950 from the plans from a 1930s model, so an absolute replica we could call it. But in Berlin, in wartime or before wartime, 2,000 aircraft of this type were produced and production stopped in 1941. Are built under license in Switzerland, Japan, Hungary, and this one in Spain, in Sweden. And although it's showing the colours of the foe, the Luftwaffe, historically it holds its place as a biplane that the German Air Force decided to use to train their pilots. So we could get a good look and feel of what they trained on, and the similarity, really, with the Tiger Moth and the Stomp aircraft. And 
and we'll be seeing Richard a little bit later in the display with the Wing Walk Company. That's his company that uh, is uh, offering Wing Walks here at Headcorn. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later as the show goes on. So it looks like Richard's making his final turn onto the 2-1 runway. We can see, or has he got one more flying past? Let's have a look. No, no, it looks like he's uh, approaching to land, throttle back, hold the attitude, let the speed come off. Use that headwind to reduce your ground speed and try not to bounce it. A lovely touchdown, there we are, and welcome back to terra firma. So we've enjoyed Richard Pickin and the display of the 1930s training aircraft, the Booker Jungmann. Thank you. Well, we can just see Richard taxing the Booker Jungmann back into its place on the line after that lovely display. And I'm looking at my flying program next. In about 20 minutes time, we're going to enjoy the sight and sound of the C-47 Dakota and the B-17, the Sally B. So we've got some real uh, aviation royalty coming through the crowd line here at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend. Now I've got a shout out for a uh, gentleman's given me a card titled Endeavour. Now this is a um, sculpture with riveting and panelling associated with the aircraft. It's a bronze casting signed and numbered by the artist. And this one is a tribute to squadron leader Geoffrey Wellham, DFC, who we were privileged to have here at Headcorn as a guest of honour about seven years ago, if my memory serves. And I've had the privilege of uh, meeting his son as well and discussing Geoffrey Wellham's book. Wonderful book. If you ever see first light in the library or in the bookshelf or on your Kindle, your smartphone, First Light by Geoffrey Wellham, one of the finest books ever written about the life of a Air Force pilot, especially in training. And uh, some of the interesting mishaps that befell these pilots under the Arnold scheme back in the 1940s. So have a look for Endeavour. He's here today with a sculpture for you to have a look at. Gregory Percival. See if you can find him.
Well, it's another shout out for the Lashingdon Air Warfare Museum. If you want to see a little bit of history, we proudly boast a well stocked museum of aviation artifacts, uniforms, aircraft parts, including the V1 flying rocket as flown by Hannah Reich, Hitler's personal pilot, offered to fly him out of Berlin on the fall of Berlin in May 1944, but he declined, decided to fit himself instead. I've had flights like that. The museum is open, it's three pounds for adults, a pound for over 60s, and a pound for children five to 16, under five to three. So if you want to have a look at the museum, I can highly recommend it. It's on the far end, go past our commentary and uh, red and white air traffic truck and keep walking. And the museum is in the corner of the airfield, open awaiting your inquisitive arrival, as it were. Thank you. All right, Keith Holland, if you're listening, listen up, pay attention. Keith Holland recently moved to Cranbrook, is that right? Just under our flight path. It's happy birthday from, is it your, your daughter? Oh, it's just a shout out. Oh, okay. Oh, for coping with you. I reckon that's worth it. And the move and everything. Damn right. Okay, well, it's a shout out for coping with everything, for the move to Cranbrook. Thank you very much. There you go. How about that? You got this. Well, I've got another shout-out. We like these shout-outs, you know. Now, Tom Kirby, are you paying attention? Tom Kirby, listen up. All the way from California, all the way from California. Tom is uh, a student visiting for the first time in three years. And he's here with his family. And the air shows his first activity on this visit. Well, I visited California. did some flying out there many, many, many years ago. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. I seem to remember how good the food was. And I used to enjoy a, uh, I used to enjoy a 
Coke float, if I remember, which is Coca-Cola with a ice cream in it, goodness me, and hash browns, wonderful California. Okay, so Tom Kirby, you're very welcome here at the show. Enjoy yourself with your family, and uh, I think you'll find we do it better than you Californians. been corrected again. See, the worst thing about this job is there's so many nerds out there who know all this detail, including this gentleman. You need to get out more, sir. You work in the museum, then you are forgiven. So tell me again, what is it? It's a Hispano Bouchon 109. It's a license card. Isn't it representing a, is, with a Merlin engine? Oh, dear. I think I'm going to go home. I've had enough of this. But it's representing a, a 109, but ME or BF is open for debate. Either, either. All right. Thank you, Lashington Air War Museum staff member. I appreciate that. OK. You can find me next time. Two beers. Well, there we are, you see. Hello. I've got a young man here, he's got his Red Arrow suit on and he's a prospective aerobatic team member and, um, and it's Glenn, hello Glenn, you're eight, congratulations to being eight, do you want to be nine? Yeah, yeah, well just be yeah, yourself. So happy birthday to Glenn, he's having a lovely time with his Red Arrow suit on, is that your sister? Yeah, is that your mum or your elder sister? Oh, it's your mum. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming to see me. Have a lovely day. And uh, you said, like you come a long way away. Oh, oh, with a Scottish accent. Like it. Like it. All right. Have fun with us today. Happy birthday again, young Ken. Right. Well, we're slowly gearing up for the next display here at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain Memorial Weekend. In memory of all those who flew and lost their lives in the... Defence of the realm, as it was said by Winston Churchill. And we're looking forward to meeting Sally B once again, the B-17 Flying Fortress, or better known as the Flying Memorial, in tandem with the C-47 Dakota, this wonderfully strong aeroplane that was built in its thousands and served with many, many countries around the world, both as a military and a civilian aircraft. There are even, uh, even a few still flying today. Very distinctive sound, those engines. If you've seen the film A Bridge Too Far, or um, Saving Private Ryan, where they depict the invasion of Europe, these aircraft were ubiquitous in towing gliders, dropping parachutists, very dangerous work indeed. Not everybody survived. Anti-aircraft fire in France and Holland was pretty fierce back in 1944. And you can just hear the turbine winding up of the RAF Red 10's helicopter. That's the squadron leader Muscat is leaving us. Having done a wonderful job with uh, his commentary on the Red Arrows, so we'll say curio to him until another time. I believe he's off to Goodwood, down near Chichester.
Any moment now, we'll see the departure of Red 10, the big 05 painted on the tail of the helicopter, just doing his final checks, I think, or his pilot, rather. And here's the sight. Get your cameras ready and those fingers on the shutters as we watch the C-47 Dakota get airborne. Wearing the white stripe D-Day markings to differentiate between Allied and enemy forces. There was absolute chaos on D-Day and at Arnhem and similar occasions. Difficult to see who was who, so these stripes were painted on the wings and you can clearly see them on the Dakota as it got airborne just then. Lovely sound that is. Got the wheels up already. There we are, we say au revoir to the uh, support team for the Red Arrows, it's called the leader Muscat. We'll put my hand out the window too far up. And we're just getting ourselves organised, holding off to the west. You can just see the outline of the C-47, and hopefully very shortly the arrival of Sally B, that wonderful contribution to the war in Europe and in the Far East. 
Hi all. Just a quick uh, well. Hi everyone. Thought I'd just give a quick another quick welcome. Um, if you've just joined the show, you missed the red arrow. Sorry about that. Uh, but they they were on earlier, and you can scoot back and you can listen to the section of audio where I wasn't monitoring the audio, so you haven't got the wonderful sound of the Hawk T1s roaring around the skies. You've just got the commentator. Senevi, um, I'll spare you the details of why that was, but we're back in action now. Part of the reason being, we're a man down this weekend. COVID has struck again, so we're a bit limited. But I wanted to say a big welcome to John Seymour. Lovely to see you in there, John. Thank you for all your emails and support over the uh, previous weeks. And who else did I spot in the chat? Do feel free to... Oh, Chris, of course. Thank you for joining us, Chris. And for your £2 donation, which you shouldn't do, but thank you for uh, drawing attention to the fact that if you are enjoying today's live broadcast, you can make a, uh, what do they call it, super chat, little donation on YouTube. Whatever it is, it's gratefully received. Um, we're just winding up, if you haven't guessed, where the C-47's out, uh, forming up with the B-17 uh, over my shoulder. Just wanted to give a quick welcome. And love the commentary, says Jack. Uh, yeah, it's good entertaining stuff here. And the Starlings are displaying a little Hampton. That's good to hear. And thank you. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you to Calvin for putting the uh, the running order there. I'm juggling a fair few plates over here, so I haven't quite managed that. Um, I've got one in my pocket, and if you scoot back to the beginning, I did run through it. But Calvin's quite helpfully popped a little running order in the chat. So thank you for that. Uh, what did I, else did I see? There was something else I wanted to say thank you to somebody slightly higher up than that. Oh, Cole giving us the head up about the B-17. Yes, well, no, just a bit of a welcome. So thank you for joining us here at Planes TV. My name's Ian. I run run the company and uh, throughout the summer season we'll be at various air shows we were at Duxford last weekend we'll see here at Headcorn all weekend the weekend shows will be on our on-demand service that's at watch.planestv.com that service will also give you access to our back catalogue of shows stretching back the last 30 years and if you subscribe this weekend you'll also have access to Air Tattoo in just a few weeks time uh, first 10 people that sign up I haven't checked whether the coupon code's been used up yet but for the first 10 people that sign up today with the coupon code SPITFIRE you'll get 20% off uh, that subscription so it lasts a month costs £10 but you'll get it for 8 you'll be able to watch Headcorn this weekend and of course Air Tattoo in just a few weeks time alright B17 I can see them running on I'm going to pop the mics back up and we'll cut to Adrian who's Oh, staring at his phone, but let's hope he's going to pick up the B-17. And uh, who failed to return from dangerous missions. So today we're going to take a little time to pay tribute to the brave men and women and the ground crews, of course, not to be forgotten, who kept the United States Army Air Force in business, particularly in East Anglia. Lots of their bases are still in existence. And... Uh, I think they're coming in through the flight line any moment. So get your shutter fingers ready, your mobile phones, your cameras, social media, anything you can to capture this. We welcome the B-17, the Sally B and the C-47 Dakota to the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend.
just muting the uh, music there. YouTube gets into gets us into trouble if we play out the commercial music, but I will bring in the lovely sound of the B17 and well, I've cheekily B7. borrowed the 633 Squadron theme, but I think it's appropriate. Just have a look at these two beautiful aircraft. Our tribute to the United States Army Air Force. On to two, live on one. Sorry. Coming to two. Two. Sally B was built in Burbank in California, 1945. Over 12,000 of these aircraft were built. And only a few survived today, and that's... Uh, that's no wonder. One of the last B-17s to be built, and she uh, didn't join the U.S. Army Air Force until June 9, 1945. Ended up as a test aircraft in the 19, 1948. And like so many, in 1954 was waiting disposal. But curiously, the French Institute Geographique bought her for survey work, so she had a reprieve and was flown in France from Criel near Paris. And in 1975, she came to the UK and restored to wartime condition, named Sally B after Ted White's partner, Ellie Salingbo, hence Sally B. And she was first seen, and I was there, the Biggin Hill Air Fair, May 1975, I remember it well. Sally B has got a whole list of television credits, including Memphis Bell, which we all remember well. We'll meet again over here, Bomber Crew and the film Black Book. And of course, apart from displaying at air shows, memorial fly pass and veteran groups, she has taken part in many memorial events, including D-Day commemorations and the VE Day fly past over the city of London in 95 and 2005 and in 2006 Sally B flew to Poland for the commemorations of the 1944 Warsaw uprising so she's really pulling her weight and uh, doing her best here's a fantastic view of her coming straight at you look at this the sound of those engines the aviation geeks amongst you their right cyclone radials with 1200 horsepower at 15,000 feet that's a fair bit of power she'll do 287 miles an hour at 25,000 feet pressurized I seem to remember and do 150 miles an hour at 5,000 feet takes her 37 minutes to climb to 20,000 feet one of the problems that crews had in wartime was the cold once you get up there the air gets thin and it gets extremely cold Remember the B-17 carried fuselage open gun turrets, so you had to make sure you had your gloves on. take a real pounding from anti-aircraft fire, cannon shells from other aircraft, extremely strong, been known to come back with half a wing missing, half a tail fin missing, and uh, I know pilots that flew her 
speak very, very highly of her. Very American in her looks. If you compare her lines to the Lancaster, a bit like comparing a Cadillac with an Austin 7. Well, Sally B is a credit to the memory of the men who flew, maintained and supported the bomber and fighter aircraft of the 8th Air Force. And it's heartwarming to see that people like you keep alive the memory of what our veterans did here over 60 years ago. The impact that the graceful sight and thundering sound of Sally B in the air had on 900 veterans, active duty Air Force and local citizens is indescribable. And they are the words of Jeffrey Kohler, the Colonel of the United States Air Force Commander. And finally he says, without the B-17, we might have lost the war. Of course, there is a Sally B Fund, which you can find online if you wish to contribute to keep this beautiful aircraft flying. They cost a lot of money to keep in the air. Spares are hard to get, of course. There's a lovely shot as Sally B runs down the flight line. Very, very simple. If you just uh, Google sallyb.org.uk, you can find the website to support this wonderful aeroplane. So let's just fade the music and listen to those right cyclone engines. Sound of victory. Bomb doors open. Uh, difficult to imagine being underneath an air raid with this type of ordnance falling on top of you, although events we're seeing on the news, of course, are redolent of what happened in World War II. And we send out, of course, all our wishes across the seas as we watch this beautiful aeroplane go through her paces.
watch the fly past of the last flying B-17 in Europe, lovingly restored and kept at Duxford. There we are, we say au revoir to Sally B and uh, I think she's making her way to Lid just down there past Rye for fuel and rest. Oh great. So I've just been informed the Dakota's coming back in so we can get a shot of her landing. So have your finger clicking fingers ready as we get a shot of the C-47 returning. We will be seeing her again a little bit later in our show, about uh, quarter past three, ten past three, where we've got a dedicated display by the uh, C-47, but a good opportunity to see her land, gear down, all those large flaps hanging down to slow her down. So once again, sallyb.org.uk if you want to make a contribution, however big or small, to keep that aircraft flying. I know there's a lot of call on your funding these days from all sorts of uh, directions, but uh, let's make that appeal to you. And uh, So where are we? That C-47's on her way round. We'll see you land very shortly. So just coming round on the base leg now, we can see the C-47 be slowing down, reducing the power, gear down, set the flap to slow it down to a manageable landing speed. Remember, a fast-moving aeroplane is difficult to land. It tends to bounce all over the place. So the trick with this or any other aircraft is configure it correctly, take your time, don't rush it. and. Um, be in good shape just as you turn onto the final approach with the aeroplane nicely under control and then let it slide down the approach and when you're ready just throttle back a little bit let the wheels touch you'll probably notice the pilot will touch on the main wheel and let the tail wheel come down it's never a good idea to force the tail wheel down just let the speed come off the airframe and gravity will do the rest and the center of gravity will will assist. Let's watch as uh, we see the approach of the C-47 now. Yeah, it's just been pointed out, a little bit of crosswind today, so we can see a little bit of crabbing there. We'll probably kick it off with the rudder as it touches down. Get it straight. Well, there's the kick of the rudder. Onto the main wheels. And the throttle closed. Little bounce there. That's just for show. That was. And then you'll see the tail come down as speed and gravity take over. There we are. How about that? We'll 
be seeing the C-47 later on in our Aero Legends Battle of Britain display. There we are, a nice round of applause, that's always welcome. So that completes our unique tribute to the Sally B and the C-47. And it's um, a complete change of scene, or as they used to say now, for something completely different. In about 20 minutes' time, we're going to present the Starlings aerobatic team. And I've got to say, in all my years of commentary, one of the finest aerobatic displays I've ever commentated. These guys are something else. So they'll be getting airborne very shortly. Hello again, everybody. Another quick hello and uh, welcome to everybody and thank you for joining. And someone who's just joined as a member on YouTube as well, whose name I've forgotten. Paul, Paul Everett, thank you so much. You can become a, um, a supporter on YouTube, which makes a small financial contribution to us each month. Paul can tell you, tell you how much because it's been a while since I've set it up. Um, it's amazing getting a round of applause for an airplane landing at an air show. But there is a bit of drama about a large airplane operating from grass and we're quite close to the um, runway of course uh, DC3 C47 let's take that for a moment gorgeous sight instructors from the school here at Headcorn and a couple of very talented boys both of them qualified recently with their commercial licenses and as instructors and are doing a great job at the flying school and they're with us today just by the simulator wheeled air services if anybody fancies a gift or making a gift of a flying lesson these are the guys to go and have a word with they'll tell you all about how a trial lesson or flying lesson is uh, is done and what you get in the briefing how much it costs and so on so have a word with elliot and zach they're feeling a bit lonely at the moment i think they're both single by the way so um pop over there and see have a look at wheeled air services and the flying lessons they're offering Looking forward to these guys. There are short runways and there are really short runways. I don't anticipate them taking off from there. A few engine checks going on over there. Uh, and prior to them getting airborne, I'll just run you through what we've got 
uh, for the rest of the afternoon. So plenty more to come right the way through to nearly six o'clock. So this is the Starlings. Then we're going to get a fighter of the BVMF uh, joining us at three. Then we'll have a C-47 back up for a display. Then Bouchon stroke spits. How many? I can't tell you. And the Aero Leg Legends combo, and it does mention Harvard's, but perhaps more besides. Then Harvard display after that. Then a wing walk display, bringing us through to five o'clock. And we'll have the Yak-3 U. And the Spitfire and Hurricane. It says nine ship plus on here. Um, We'll see what we get when it comes to it, shall we? Uh, lovely afternoon here. We're getting spits and spots of rain, but the lights behind us, beautiful puffy clouds, which make it really nice for video. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I'll mute that background audio. The guys are backtracking now. Uh, what else did I spot in the chat? Ashley saying, the sounds with a big love heart eyes. Yes, better now than it was during the Reds when I had the... Um, the audio dropped because there was an interview taking place not right next to my microphones and then we're a man down this weekend due to covid so no one monitoring audio at that particular moment bit sad but uh, hopefully didn't detract too much from the red arrows did we get a rolling display i think we had a rolling display didn't we yeah great stuff uh battle of show in june hello everyone saying oliver hello oliver lovely to see you and Psychedelic Time Traveller, I'm going to the Sunday Air Show. Psychedelic Time Traveller, is that this year, last year or next? Off the go! And I'll leave you with the... Um, that's your commentator. Well, we've just seen get airborne the Starling display team. This is new, new, fresh team to the airshow circuit. Been established three or four years now. Had to uh, hold things while lockdown went through its paces, but now the airshow season is back up and running, and hopefully, without any more interruptions, we welcome Michael Pickin and Tom Cassells. Tom, a real veteran of the air show circuit. I've commentated on him since the late 80s. He's been around for a long time and he's teamed up with Michael Pickin, who as I said earlier, learned to fly here with flying school at Head Corner. I remember doing his radio telephony exam and he must have been about 17. He's gone on to have a fantastic career, not only as an aerobatic display pilot, but he's a, as a captain now on the Boeing 767 with two airlines and he might well give you the PA one day as you're reclining in your seat awaiting your first gin and tonic as you go on holiday he could well be your captain flying you to your sunny destination but when he's not got his airline uniform on he's with us at Headcorn we go smoke on as we welcome the Starlings aerobatic team
tight formation here. The aircraft are an extra and a cap 232, very similar but different aircraft, if you know what I mean. Over 300 horsepower there, each engine. With an extremely efficient power to weight ratio. Very, very precise flying controls. And you can see the very, very tight formation they're making. Absolute precision flying. Tom Cassells started his career dropping parachutists, would you believe, when he got his PPL back in the day, as they say, and got into aerobatics in a, the early 90s and uh, got a real taste for it, started picking up a few trophies and he's won the national championships more than once. Oh, nice. roll there. Watch as the aeroplane, the speed decreases, and start to slide, and kick the rudder hard, kick it over, pick up the speed, and they're flying again. Mike tells me he shuts his eyes when he does that. Unbelievable. And uh, Tom has reached the lofty heights as a display authorization examiner. So when you come to give a display at an air show, Tom will observe your display from the ground and anything he likes or dislikes, he'll make a note. So making sure that everybody is of the highest standard when they come and uh, exhibit at shows like us today. the heart 
I dedicate that to that newly married couple who had a shout out earlier. You can see how the wind has got hold of the smoke aloft. About a thousand or so feet, just dragging it away quickly. It's quite breezy up there today. Hesitation rolls. Look at the bakers. We're looking at the uh, extra NG, 300 mile an hour or so aeroplane, 300 horses there, designed just for aerobatics. You wouldn't go on holiday in this, hopefully. And there we are, look at that stalling there on the wing. Just letting gravity take over. what they call hanging on the propeller. It's a beautifully executed spin there. Beautifully under control, lovely recovery. Back into level flight. So you can see why the Starlings are winning all the prizes and uh, becoming very popular on the air show circuit. children watching, please don't try this at home. The CAP 232 is a French designed aircraft for teaching aerobatics. And it's, uh,
Well, you are enjoying an aerobatic masterclass from the Starlings. What a display. Precision flying in a quite a strong wind up there. Absolutely magnificent display. Upside down is interesting, you have to remember which way to push or pull. We are privileged to see Tom Cassells and uh, Michael Ficken give their very, very best. The young and the old, Mike, the young aerobatic pilot, and Tom a bit more my vintage, but my goodness, what experience and what a display, got to say. The Cat 232 and the extra aircraft, very similar in design, both have the same aim, one built in France, the other American origin. I say over 300 horsepower driving them at up to speeds of over 300 miles an hour. Takes some real fitness and fortitude to fly that accurately. Know where you are, where your other pilot is at all times. And these guys are really dedicated. Privileged to have them here at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain. Coming round, they've completed their display, slow the aeroplane down, as I explained earlier. A little bit of crosswind, you can see the windsock is blowing across the runway, and the ideal situation is for the wind to blow down the runway, and we absorb that energy of the wind to slow the aeroplane down. But it's normally a bit of fancy rudder work to uh, cope with a niggly crosswind. A little bit of pedaling. So we welcome back Mike and Tom from that magnificent display. Look at that. Nice. Worthy of your applause. One of the finest aerobatic displays on the circuit without question. Sponsored by Nui Ice Cream. Got that wrong last year, got told off. Oh dear. Available in all good supermarkets. Probably gone up in price, I should think. Well, there we are. That's the conclusion of the Starlings aerobatic display team. And as they come back in, I think they deserve a huge round of applause and appreciation for that display they've given you. Come on, let's give it up for the Starlings aerobatic team. Michael and Tom, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Wow. Magnificent. the hour we're going to welcome at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend the Battle of Britain Memorial flight on their way
Well, this time they can hear you as they get out of the noisy cockpit. So thank you for that. Well-deserved round of applause for Mike and Tom. What a magnificent display that was. Fantastic. Well, we've been informed the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Hurricane is on its way in. The, shall we say, less famous of the two fighters of the Battle of Britain. The Spitfire gets all the plaudits, but the Hurricane supported it more than admirably. Different construction from the Spitfire. Developed as a biplane originally in the 1930s. They took the top wing off modified it slightly, put a Merlin engine in it, and the Hawker Hurricane was born. A very manoeuvrable, strong platform. And there's often been arguments as to which aeroplane had more shot down, more aircraft in the war and so on. But I don't think it was ever really proven. And we're delighted to welcome the Battle of Britain Memorial Fight Hurricane to our display this afternoon. I hear he's inbound, so we'll just be patient and expect his arrival. But we'll get a good look at the sight and sound of the type of aircraft that were in the south of England during the Battle of Britain. And uh, when they said scramble, it was often to a hurricane, not necessarily a Spitfire. They look a little bit uh, similar to very long distance squint, but if you look at the shape of the wing of the hurricane versus the Spitfire, it's quite a different shape. Also, there's that hump behind the cockpit is another way of defining its uh, profile or its silhouette. Just look around to your left, just coming round the tree line. If you were a German in a trench in the Second World War, this site may well have been a laxative to you. Here she comes. So uh, we welcome Andy Priest in LF363 from the Battle of Britain Memorial Fund. And we can hear the sound of that lovely 27 litre V12. This aircraft capable of over 300 miles per hour at full chat or full throttle as we say a 600 mile range so into Europe and back again just look at that wing shape and compare that to the Spitfire
often flown by young, inexperienced pilots not long out of flight training school. Imagine you're strapped into a hurricane for the first time, big powerful fighter plane with heavy armament out over the English Channel and a angry Luftwaffe pilots on your tail wanting to kill you. Evasive action was of course necessary and good handling skill to avoid or get an aircraft off your tail. One of the features of the Hurricane was its uh, cage around the cockpit. I've just been told by a gentleman his father flew the Hurricane and on a crash landing the cage in which the cockpit was built saved him. So that's an interesting fact, part of the design of the Hurricane. Kept alive by the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight whose job it is is to keep these historic aircraft flying in tip-top condition so we can enjoy Andy Priest's display today. Imagine it's coming at you, guns blazing. I said earlier it evolved from the Hawker Fury biplane wood and metal framework covered in fabric much cheaper and quicker to build than the Spitfire about 10,000 man hours to build a hurricane whereas the Spitfire took about 15,000 man hours to build slightly slimmer wing profile of the Spitfire gave it superior speed but the Hurricane had other qualities as they say. Entered service in 1937 about a year before the Spitfire the Hurricane was proving itself and was available in greater numbers for its finest hour in the Battle of Britain and they played a crucial role in the defence of Britain, shooting down, it says here, debatably, more enemy aircraft than the Spitfire. Famous for its 303 Browning machine guns, one complaint of Battle of Britain pilots was they would sometimes jam just as you were in for the kill. And uh, quite, a short, uh, quite a short period of time to fire your cannons, less than 20 seconds and you were normally out of ammunition. So you had to use it very sparingly if you got the enemy in your sights. So let's enjoy the last pass with Andy Priest from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. The beautiful lines of Sydney Cam's Hawker Hurricane. A 
Uh, we say thanks to the Royal Air Force Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, who dedicate their personnel to keeping these aircraft flying for us to enjoy today. Well, we're just getting ourselves organised, the flying display team here. And uh, the next item on the Fly Pro, as we call it, is the C-47 display, the Dakota, which we did see earlier with the Sally B, and now this aircraft has got the stage all to herself for her own display. And uh, this aircraft is in service with Aero Legends and has been spending a lot of time doing film work and flights over the Normandy beaches and licensed to carry passengers. Have a look at the website and see what Aero Legends are up to with this lovely aircraft. Indeed, have a look at Aero Legends website for all of the flights that they're offering. The flying in, in, the, in a Spitfire, in the spare seat, fly alongside a Spitfire, fly in the Harvard, the Tiger Moth, get a real taste of these historic aircraft crewed by top professional pilots. And if you want to make a gift, an original gift, 
get onto the Era Legends website and see what they have got to offer. They're a fine team and offer a fine product, very well done, and every detail is taken care of. So that's Era Legends here at Headcorn and at North Weald. More about that later. So we're just on the brakes in the Dakota, winding up the winding up the pressures on the engines when they're both stable, reading about the same, let go, a little bit of forward stick to get the tail up and then we're airborne. Well, here we are. Have a look and listen. Here she goes. Wearing the RAF roundels, Pegasus with her D-Day markings as described earlier. Could have been towing a horse glider back on the, or in the days of D-Day or the fated Arnhem landings, of which the film the Bri A Bridge Too Far depicts so well, or um, Saving Private Ryan, the opening 50-minute sequence of that film is probably the best depiction of life on a beach on D-Day, on the 6th of June. Originally built as a uh, civilian transport, then converted for military use. Very, very strong reinforced floor. Used for the carriage of pretty well anything in wartime, from jeeps to personnel, paratroopers, generals, dropping of supplies to the resistance. It was a very, very versatile airplane indeed. Now, a lot of people don't know, but there is a origin to the name Dakota.
from the initials Douglas Aircraft Transport Aircraft, Dakota. That's apparently the origin, and the RAF took it on, and it became known as the DAC. Famous actors, Jimmy Edwards, if any of you remember him, any of the older generation, he was a Dakota pilot in the Second World War. Unarmed, of course, just um, vulnerable to enemy fire, more vulnerable from ground attack than any other anti-aircraft fire often brought them down. I was speaking recently to Clive Edwards, who's a very well-known American aircraft engineer, goes all over the world fixing these aircraft, and he said in his opinion it's without doubt one of the strongest aircraft ever built that he's ever worked on. Extremely strong construction, take a real hammering, carry a huge payload, and as we can see, unique looking uh, shape to it, no, couldn't be anything else. For you war historians, the C-47 saw action in the Far East, in New Guinea and in Burma. Guadalcanal as part of the winkling out of the Japanese at the, toward the end of the war. The Americans spent an awful lot of manpower and aircraft and ships and so on, getting the Japanese to surrender along those islands up from Formosa. Battle of Bastogne, of course as depicted in uh, Band of Heroes, an excellent series that depicted the journey through Europe so well. And once again, I can boast a family connection. The C-47 was used in the Berlin airlift when the Soviets blockaded Berlin starving the civilians of food and water and power. These aircraft were used, my father flew the Berlin airlift on the C-54, or known as the DC-4, as opposed to the C-47. And they flew one after another after another, loaded with coal, fuel, flour, sugar, to keep the population of Berlin alive until that blockade was lifted. The result, as we know later on, many years later, was the Berlin Wall. So we're going to take our last look at the C-47 as it makes its final pass. Just have a look and listen. by Aero Legends, Pegasus is, as I say, and so keep these days in all sorts of activities. Have a look at the website and see just exactly what's going on with the C-47. Used in civilian service after the war, I can remember going as a passenger on one with East African Airways in about 1972, I think it was, uh, out from uh, Nairobi to Malindi, most exciting trip over the uh, jungles of Kenya. British European Airways, Aer Lingus, operated this type in the early 50s as civil aviation began to re-establish itself after wartime. And right up until fairly recently, they were used in South America. I believe there are still a couple still flying, one with turbine engines, I understand. And we've watched this afternoon a real tribute to this workhorse, this well-built, well-designed, muscular aeroplane that made such a contribution to the Allied effort 
in uh, World War II and beyond. So let's watch as the commander turns into wind, a little bit of crosswind on the main runway. So plenty of hands and feet, as we used to say. Get the speed right, gear down, get the green lights for the wheels. Select the flap, you can hear the hissing of the high, uh, the air-driven flaps. Hiss like crazy. Well, it's a huge thank you and shout out to the commander of the aeroplane today, Andrew Dixon, one of the few licensed qualified pilots on the register allowed to fly this aeroplane. Charming chap, very experienced indeed. And just hear him throttle back, leading the speed off the airframe, ready for touchdown. Oh, that was a good one. Oh, one for show. So it's a huge thank you to Andrew Dixon for that magnificent display. Look at that. And we're privileged here at the Aero Legends weekend to enjoy the sight and sound of the victorious Allied aircraft that helped us so, so well in all, all those years ago. And as we watch modern war warfare on the television and internet these days, we see how things have changed, but in many ways haven't changed at all.
Achtung, Achtung, just got airborne is the ME or BF 109 replica. We've had some discussion about the origin of this aeroplane. Who built it? It's the Spanish Bouchon version, but it's representing the ME or BF 109 that was the foe of the Royal Air Force in 1940 when the Battle of Britain was declared when this country really was genuinely threatened by invasion. These aircraft came over the French coast in droves and it was the RAF's job to repel them. They were skilled pilots, the Luftwaffe. They trained on gliders in the early 30s. All Luftwaffe pilots had glider experience. Then onto the Booker Jungmann that we saw earlier. And in onto the 109, a small cockpit very compact aeroplane, fairly well armed. And we're going to have a look at what it must have felt to watch a dogfight over the skies of Kent. And we're privileged today at the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend to recreate the sights and sounds once again of a dogfight or a pursuit.
the Spitfires are being scrambled. Ring the bell and run like hell. We have an invader in our airspace. You can imagine young area RAF pilots grabbing their helmets. The ground crew winding up the engines. The fuel was already on board. Bandits. Sometimes very little clue as to where the enemy aircraft might be. Some assistance from the ground, of course, but not always enough. So the Air Legends squadron are at the hold, getting ready to repel this Messerschmitt. And as I said earlier, these aircraft all look the same but different. They've got that uh, similar shape, size, power, weight and armament with some very subtle differences. One of them being the skill of the pilot. Stations like RAF Kenley, Duxford, Croydon, Hawkinge, Biggin Hill were ready with their squadrons of Spitfires. Air Chief Marshal Dowding issued an instruction that one aircraft should be held back at every squadron in the hangar, no matter what. So the Royal Air Force always had a reserve. I can recommend Len Dayton's book, Fighter, to you. Very informative. So here is this ME-109 beating up Headcorn. Most unwelcome. So we need to get the uh, Aero Legends Spitfires Airworthy ASAP to see off this nuisance. Parkinson and Charlie Brown just about to get airborne. Parker, you go get him.
And the trick is to get on the Messerschmitt's tail, which is just what's happening here. skies of Kent in August, September 1940. This was a common sight as the civil population looked up in wonder as the RAF Spitfires often got on the tail of these hurricanes, uh, these, sorry, these 109s. Hurricanes as well as Spitfires, I meant to say. Very difficult to get the enemy aircraft in your gun sight long enough to give him a burst, but if you did and you hit him and hit the oil cooler, you were in business. One of the important considerations dogfighting like this was consumption of fuel and what would sometimes happen is the enemy would break off and return to France. He simply didn't have the fuel to continue the fight. They've got him.
can see they've, they've hit his engine, he's in trouble. to kill a probable or a possible if they thought they had downed an enemy aircraft it required independent verification and witnesses often a kill or probable is shared by two or three pilots when they landed they were debriefed very thoroughly as to the order of battle Enjoy the graceful lines of the Supermarine Spitfire. Wonderful design, that elliptical wing, the power of the Rolls Royce Merlin engine. The perfect combination, really. Named after the Shakespeare character Spitfire, curiously. who designed her sadly didn't live to see her life as a fighter, fighter aircraft and the success that she had. He sadly died before the war but his legacy is this magnificent beautiful aeroplane. Charlie Brown back for tea and medals. One of the great game changers with the Spitfire was the fitting of a metal three-bladed propeller. Hitherto it was a two-bladed wooden propeller and the difference was astonishing especially with the upgraded Merlin engine. paying tribute today once again to the brave pilots of 1940, some who suffered dire consequences in battle, some were very badly burned, and uh, went to Archie McKindo's famous hospital in East Grinstead to be put back together, known as the Guinea Pigs, or the Guinea Pig Club, and some of you may know that uh, Archie McKindo and one of his patients appeared in the Battle of Britain film a little walk on part. So there we are, it's a big hand for Charlie. Beautifully done as always. And 
that aircraft is available to you if you'd like a ride in a Spitfire. That is available through Aero Legends. Have a look at the website. They can give you more information than I can. If you'd like to buy a very different gift for somebody or have a very rare experience to fly in a historic, iconic, war-winning aeroplane, Aero Legends is your destination. And uh, here we are, here's Parky, just sliding in on the wind, just slipping in. Just slowing it down, flaps down, hold it off. Notice the undercarriage very close together. It'll have a break. Just a dab. So there we are, that concludes the dogfight between the Bouchon replica or the ME109, BF109 replica, and the Spitfire Squadron of Aero Legends. And don't forget when uh, Parky emerges from the aircraft, give him a big hand, show your appreciation for his flying skill and showmanship. Former leader of the Red Arrows, of course, a very distinguished RAF career. Parky Parkinson MBE, and we're privileged to have him here with Aero Legends flying for us here at Hickle. Real asset, as is Charlie Brown, very popular with the public, and uh, take their job very, very seriously, and uh, always out to give you the ultimate pleasure if you come and see us for a flight in Spitfire. Next on the Fly Pro is the Harvard display. So we'll get them warmed up for that. We'll let you know. I just heard the voices of Gavin Ashdown and John O'Connell, the commanders of the T6 Texan or Harvard. And they're just taxing out, preparing for their display. goes Parky, lovely show as always. So from the Merlin engine to the Pratt & Whitney radial which powers the T6 Texan or Harvard Used under the Arnold scheme in the North American and Canadian training schools to train Commonwealth pilots, it was decided that there's a shortage of pilots as the war developed, so they called on pilots from the Commonwealth, New Zealand, Rhodesia as it was then called, South Africa, Australia, and uh, they were trained under the Arnold scheme, which was a 
idea to travel to the United States, which was safe and not under threat, and train with the United States Army Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force. And the type of aircraft used once they'd done basic training on Tiger Moths in the United Kingdom. They were shipped out to America. The reason I know so much is my father was on the Queen Mary in 1941 to train on a Harvard, which we're about to see. And he was then, when he qualified, back to the United Kingdom and ended up with Coastal Command, often called the Forgotten Command, did a lot of work. And he told me a story one night about going out to find the Tirpitz. How interesting. It frightened me to death, I'm sure. But he had a glorious career, went on to fly for Freddie Laker, you may remember, retiring in 1980, which seems an awfully long time ago now. 26,000 hours in his book. So that's how he started on these lovely Harvard aircraft, fully aerobatic, designed for training. They were used in combat in far-flung uh, reaches of the world, but they were not really a combat aircraft. Got the Dakota just lining up and the two spits. So according to my fly pro, goodness me, it's four o'clock already. Having too much fun here. We're going to get the Aero Legends Combo Airborne. The Harvards are going to hold off and then they will display after that.
goodness me, it's getting noisy around here. Well, we're just looking at the Aero Legends combo. Aero Legends have a fleet now, I would call it, or squadron, of Tiger Moths, Harvards, Spitfires, and C-47s. And they welcome you to their Battle of Britain weekend and their display. The uh, pilots you're familiar with, I'm sure, Archie Parkinson, Charlie Brown, both uh, retired Air Force pilots now and both had glittering careers in the military. In the Harvard, Gavin Ashdown, retired KLM captain, 25 years flying for the Dutch airline and as an instructor here at Headcorn, spends his spare retirement time teaching here. Always a pleasure to see Gavin. Spitfire in battle requires a cool head, good decision making, and we're going to get a demonstration of that today. Two Aero Legend Spitfires, Golf Charlie India Charlie Kilo and Golf Charlie Golf Yankee Juliet. Here come the Duck and the Harvards. Certainly appreciate a difference in speed there. Just throttling back a little bit. And the Harvard's got that distinctive noise as the rasp of the propeller. That's the propeller tips going supersonic. That's just its design. And normally the lads throttle back and bring the pitch back a bit just to quieten them down. But they are unmistakable. aircraft built at Castle Bromwich, 1944, so toward the end of the war, one of the aircraft were built in car factories, given over to war production. or Elizabeth saw action at D-Day after D-Day on the battlefields of northern France with Canadian pilots involved in reconnaissance and uh, frontline patrols and escort duties of the Lancaster. This aircraft Charlie Kilo Elizabeth brought down two Messerschmitt 109s in her war service.
314 St George, again built at Castle Bromwich. He's a high level fighter with e spec wings, slightly shorter wing for higher speed. And she was delivered to Lynham in the March 45. So for the Gold Coast Squadron at Chilpot in Hampshire, before they were re-equipped with Tempest. She went on to Bentwaters and Suffolk, and she's currently painted in the code of Dragon Squadron. The aircraft have uh, had very long lives, but, but have been restored to airworthy condition. They weren't always as pristine as this. They have lain in hangars and yards over the years until they have been rescued. Yankee Judith ended up in Cape Town in South Africa at a very sorry end in a scrapyard, but was brought back to life in 1969, brought home. And she came to the UK via Canada in 2009. Aero Legends acquired her in 2011 and a full restoration was commenced. <laughs> NX341 Charlie Kilo ended up as a bit of a wreck in France where she rested for a long time on display, but returned to the historic flying company at uh, Duxford in 2015. And here come the Harvards and the C-47 once again. Whilst at Biggin Hill, Elizabeth or Charlie Kilo was fitted with a rear seat, thus becoming a two-seat Spitfire, and it operates regularly for Aero Legends, and as I said before, it's available to you if you fancy a ride in one, or maybe you'd like to give somebody a ride in a Spitfire, and get a sight and sound and feel of what it must be like to fly in a high-performance fighter, for a rare opportunity. Geeks amongst you will have heard, you can hear the slight different in sound. This is a Charlie Kilo has a Packard Merlin, slightly different engine, American built but similar design to the Rolls Royce Merlin. If you want a stat for the uh, for the pub quiz, 20,351 Spitfires were built from start to finish. And we're privileged to see the last of the few here at our Era Legends Battle of Britain weekend. Absolutely marvellous display.
of the great attributes of the Spitfire was the ability to make a very tight turn and get out of the way of enemy fire. That immensely strong and well-designed wing got many a pilot out of trouble. These two harbors airborne are bearing the colors of the Californian, Californian Air National Guard and the livery of a U USAF advanced training unit. About 600 still flying today. Oh, here come the spits again. Look out. Several marks of Spitfire were designed and developed, Mark 9 being probably the most ubiquitous and best known, right up to a Mark 21. It was a very versatile aircraft, used for high level reconnaissance as well, 40,000 feet on oxygen, taking uh, photographs of enemy positions, very high speed. Ironically, pilots have come back from North America having trained on the, the Harvard and their next aircraft may well have been the Spitfire into operational service. What the Harvard gave them was a feel for an aerobatic aeroplane, so they were prepared for a performance aeroplane like the Spitfire. Highly entertaining characters if you ever get the chance to meet the fly with Parky or Charlie. Absolute delight, great company, full of anecdotes and real couple of uh, safe pair of hands as we say in the flying business. And if you are inclined to book a flight in the Spitfire, it'll be Charlie or Parky, more likely will get you airborne with Aero Legends here at headquarters. And here comes the C-47 Dakota, if you've got your cameras ready. Just touching down on the threshold once again of the 28 runway. 
I think he's getting the hang of it now. That was better. As a matter of interest, one of the last commercial aircraft to be built with a tailwheel. The Douglas Aircraft Corporation continue with nose wheel aircraft, typically the C-54 Skymaster, and the pilots found them a lot easier to land, whereas the British were still designing aircraft with tail wheels, the Avro Tudor, for example, which uh, was always a little more difficult to handle. In typical British fashion, it was fitted out like an Elizabethan galleon, all brass and shiny wood. Note that very close undercarriage the Spitfire was known for, quite close together. Just had to get it right. There we are. He's doing it on purpose just to see if you're watching. The thing is, with landing, you're trying to get speed off the airframe, that's the challenge. A little bit of crosswind here today doesn't help. Oh, they did well. Slipping in on the wind there, just using what uh, wind there is, and then straightening up onto the runway. What we call a side slip in the train. And if you're not familiar with the Aero Legends Spitfire, you can see the double bubble canopy there with the rear seat. That's where you sit if you book a flight in the Spitfire. So the North American T6 Harvard, or Texan, got a couple just getting airborne. Listen to that unmistakable sound of the propeller tips, can't miss it. So, an unarmed advanced trainer designed to give young pilots a stepping stone to fighters such as the Mustang or the Spitfire, designed with dual controls and a large birdcage cockpit to give excellent all-round visibility. Now, a lot of these Harvards were built in Canada as well as North America under license. And they were winterized for extreme conditions, as you, one can get in North America, including a heated cockpit, which took its heat from the exhaust system. Not with any leaks, I hope. Now, the British and Commonwealth versions had a spade-style control stick to familiar, familiarize the pilots with the Spitfire control stick so they knew the feel. So when they got on operational duty they had a, a better understanding of the aeroplane.
So young pilots from the suburbs of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth would arrive at these stations in North America, in Winnipeg, Terrell in Texas, and they would be introduced to the T-6 Harvard, having flown possibly the Stearman, which we have with the Wingwalk Company. They stepped up to the Harvard for some aerobatic training. We can hear that unmistakable prop tip noise of the Harvard, the radial engine as they come through. This will be a typical site at a training base in North America, say in 1941, as the Commonwealth Air, um, Air Force was put together, preparing these young pilots for action back in Europe. demonstrating the aerobatic qualities of this aeroplane. doesn't look particularly aerobatic, but as you can see, that would have been the pilot's first taste. popular figure here at Headcorn, starting his flying career here about, uh, goodness, about over 30 years ago, probably more, flew the parachute aircraft here for many years, and he's a fine companion in the wings bar, I can assure you, say a long commercial career with KLM on the Embraer and Fokker aircraft, now retired and spending his day, days with us retirees, Keeping the aerodrome going. just heard that increase in power, how that prop makes that distinctive sound.
Aerobatic training was mandatory as part of the training course and pilots were graded on their acceptability for aerobatic flight pretty quickly. And in their training notes it would have been mentioned and when the course was finished they were allocated the appropriate type of aircraft to fly on their return to United Kingdom. It's all right, Romy, that's enough. He does get carried away, you know. Where are these armors gone? So this might be the site at somewhere like Winnipeg. As the crew got better and better at tight formation flying, this would be assessed how well they could all keep up together. after the war, Ecuador, Africa, Kenyan Air Force, Adam, South Africa, they went all over the place because it made a very good trainer for post-war air forces as well. Once again, these aircraft are maintained to absolutely tip-top standards. They have to be. Every, any part that needs replacing is replaced to keep them in top airworthy condition. And again, uh, an experience in the harbour is available with Aero Legends. Check out the website. All the info you need is there. You might even squeeze in a Tiger Moth, a Harvard, and a Spitfire all in one day. Who knows? come once again, a lovely sight and sound of these vintage training aircraft. In the Green Harvard nearest to you, John O'Connell is in command. John is a uh, corporate pilot, flies a citation this jet, we would call it. Been doing that for many years. Thank you, Tom. And John enjoys nothing more than putting his citation in the hangar and coming over here to headquarters and uh, giving the Aero Legends customers a fine day out. My old dad told me a story. He was in a Harvard in Texas on a navigation exercise with his map on his knee. And he landed this aeroplane, got out, and this fella came up to him and said, what are you doing here? We ain't even open yet. 
And of course, he landed at the wrong place. Easily done in those days. My point being, they were building runways as quickly as they could for training in those days. America geared up for war very, very quickly. Responded very well, certainly after Pearl Harbor, which advanced the war quickly. And one of the results was this training scheme called the Arnold Scheme. And, uh, what a success it was. The Bolivian Air Force had them. Brazilian Air Force, they went everywhere after the war. There were hundreds, surplus to requirements, crated up and shipped out to countries to train their pilots as well. A wonderful aircraft, very clever design, and uh, delighted to see it displaying with us here at the Aero Legends weekend. Having given himself enough height and speed to recover from the loop. One of the earliest aerobatic maneuvers to learn. Don't forget to fling your head back. the last pass of the T6 Harvard Texan aircraft for your delight and delectation this afternoon to give you a taste and flavor of the early training airplanes used pre-war to prepare our pilots for the Spitfire and the Hurricane and whatever beyond and delighted to see them all here resplendent at the Aero Legends weekend so it's the last pass those cameras ready. You can hear those very subtle control inputs on the throttle there just to keep it all together. Here comes Gavin for his last pass. So they're just uh, connecting on the left downwind side of the 2-8 runway to prepare to land. Same old technique, slow it down. Don't forget to put the wheels down. There's an old saying about putting undercarriage down. Those who have and those who are going to, forget it, that is. A lot of aircraft are fitted with a horn, so as you throttle back, you get a blaring horn in your ear reminding you you haven't put the wheels down. But under stress, it's amazing, amazing how deaf you can get. And there have been a lot of wheels up accidents over the years. And as the Harvards set up for their landing back on the 2-8 runway, 
the wing walk team are getting ready to line up and depart with their wing walkers and they yes they are real people they're not dummies waving no. And once again onto the main wheels and let the aeroplane the gravity take over as the speed peels off. The, you just see a little kick of rudder there, look, just to slow it all down. The speed, the speed back. And I can assure you pilots take great pride in a good landing. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Johnny, get back in your citation now. You leather seat. Champagne. And last of all, Gavin's coming just to bring up the rear. So there we are, that's a good look at the T6 Texan or Harvard. Mainstay of the training program back in 1941 onwards. Ironically, the next aircraft we're going to see is the Boeing Stearman. And that was normally flown before you went on to the harbour on the Arnold Scheme squadrons. Typically be Tiger Moth followed by the Boeing. You can hear that slight clatter clang, that's the hollow fuselage making all that noise. Once again, little kick of rudder, slow it all down. And then use your feet to steer it back to the holding position. The flying controls have little use now. Just some steering. Well, very shortly, we're going to introduce you to the Wing Walk Company. And uh, it's pretty obvious what they do from that title. Based here at Headcorn, two of these aircraft, very, very successful uh, business that Richard has started. There's a lot of demand for wing walking if you are under a certain weight and a certain disposition. It's not for me, thank you. As I said earlier, I'm a born-again coward. Wouldn't consider anything like this. So we're going to enjoy the sound of the radial biplane designed by Boeing. The American uh, Army Air Force went to them with a specification for training. And you can see mild similarities with the European style of trainer. But being American, of course, it's a little bigger. Let's give them a wave as they go by.
Now we've got a father and son duo here, Michael Pickin, who entertained you so well with the Starlings display, and his dad Richard, who's the chief pilot of the Wingwalk Company. Richard and Michael, of course, his deputy. And it's a very well-regulated setup, like everything else. When we're taking money from the public to take you flying, it all has to be very carefully monitored and checked, and all the aircraft must be in tip-top condition. And the assistant with the wing walk company will get you up on the wing and strap you in as tight as possible. And off they go. Normally about a 10, 12 minute flight around the head corn circuit. Some of Richard's flying uh, pilots include a Virgin Atlantic captain, Michael, who's a TUI captain on the Boeing now. Callum Collins, just gone back to British Airways after a long furlough. When these guys get tired of long distance travel, come back to have some real fun here at Headcourt with the Wingwalk Company. They wouldn't normally fly in formation like this, but for the show today, they're giving you a little bit of formation expertise. There won't be any swapping places or anything like that. As has done, was done in the Americas in the 1930s, 20s and 30s. Anybody wearing a wig or a hairpiece, not recommended? At Headcorn, we get a lot of charities uh, coming to us to book a flight to raise money for a good cause. One of the team will make a wing walk. Of course, the Parachute Club, which is not operating today, offers similar experiences. And there's a special offer today. If you book a flight today, there is a free HD recording of your flight thrown in, normally charged for that. If you book today, Richard says you can have that on the house. The darker of the two, the one behind the, like the yellow painted aircraft was recently purchased and has undergone a complete overhaul from top to bottom. A lot of time and money has been spent refurbishing Whiskey Kilo and it's been wrapped as they call it. That's the uh, livery, that's not uh, American music, to look like its sister ship. Jeremy Brickshire is flying Whiskey Kilo. I've known Jeremy since he was a, dare I say it, a boy working in the hangar. He's worked his way up the greasy pole of aviation and has already got the Boeing 767 on his license, flown transatlantic. He has also been the chief pilot for photo flight, flying uh, across the channel, photographing shipping and he's also a leading light as a Spitfire pilot. Got about a thousand hours on Spitfires now. Very talented, capable boy, related to a DFC holder, his uncle. He won the DFC in the Battle of Britain. On the top of the wing is Romy Ford, a well-known character here at headquarters, done a lot for public relations and helping out flyers and Romy's a real good stick and she's a qualified pilot herself and just couldn't resist the opportunity to wing walk today with Jeremy at the controls. And Lee McKilo, Richard Pickin, 
And the wing walker is Maeve Pickin, Richard's daughter. So it's a father and daughter team today. And they describe this as a family business at Headcorn, with uh, Maeve's twin and Richard's son, Michael. They're also flying as well. It's amazing how the family lineage works in aviation. Romy's father was a typhoon pilot in the Second World War. It seems to run in families somehow. Now, if you're wondering what this is going to cost you at present fuel prices, if you wing walk with the wing walk company in the week, the charge is £360. Just a, a mere taxi ride from here to Brighton. Or a weekend wing walk at 410. Special deal is on today if you book today for an HD film of your experience. So go and have a word with the wing walk company. That figure may not be uh, correct as of Friday in case the fuel prices go up. But who knows? But to be serious for a moment, this aeroplane, this Boeing Stearman, gave the Inexperienced pilot, a feel of power and handling, very powerful radio, radial engine prior to the Harvard. Not really a battle aircraft or fighter aeroplane, very much a trainer. Occasionally they have been used for the odd skirmish, but I wouldn't uh, go on about it. So here they go once again, let's see if we give them a wave as they come by. Braver than me, hey! I don't know how much they can see. My eyes will be streaming up there, I should think. But once again, Richard is keeping alive the vintage training aircraft from North America, as well as offering wing walks. Young pilots come through here and get to have a go and learn the handling of these old aeroplanes and how to handle these old radial engines. They can be a little temperamental. Well, I've got a little bit of uh, blurb from Richard, and it says here, experience the ultimate thrill spills, ups and downs of speed, power, and freedom with the Wing Walk Company. Go big, take to the wing, and feel the adrenaline rush. I bet. So challenge yourself for kicks or raise money for charity. Push yourself to the limit, and follow in the footsteps of history's pioneering daredevils. Couldn't have put it better myself. So if this appeals to you, or you'd like to make a gift, a family member or maybe you don't want to see that family member again whatever contact the wing walk company makes a very popular gift and there's a certain validity with the with the booking have a have a word with them
Now that's a pretty good representation of a wing walk in the local area, just in the circuit, nice and gently, no aerobatics, no making you feel unwell or anything like that. Lovely display by Jeremy there and, uh, and uh, Michael. And Richard, I think, about father of Michael. just swinging round onto the final approach for their touchdown. It's the same routine, slow it down, let the speed come off, touch it down. Ease the throttle back. Let's give them a wave as they touch down. The Wing Walk Company. There we are, that's the effervescent, effervescent Romy. Can't keep a good girl down, you know. She loves it. Yeah? That's the second of the, let's give her a hand, how lovely, there we are. If you fancy a go, have a, have a word with the wing walk company. Next on the Fly Pro is the Yak 3. I don't want you to be. Um, how do I put this? Isn't that a Russian aeroplane? There's a very interesting bit of history with this particular aircraft. It's not Russian, it wasn't built in Russia. Built by the Yakalev company in Romania. And I want you to notice the Ukrainian flag on the tail fin, and we're going to have a fine display of what we could describe as an East European fighter aeroplane. So we're going to let Bob Davey get airborne. Bob Davey learned to fly with Kent Gliding Club many, many years ago and did some flying here to build his hours for his commercial license. And he's a guest of ours today in his Yak, his Yak 3, radial version, much feared aeroplane, and a very, very high success rate. So let's just watch as Bob gets this aeroplane airborne. Meanwhile, we welcome back the Boeing Stearman team of the Wingwalk Company. Now we 
Let us give him a big hand for our two brave sisters on top of the wing. That's Maeve at the front. It's all gone quiet, thank goodness. Big thank you to Richard and Jeremy for that lovely display. And to Maeve and Romy on top of the wing there. Bob Davy is positioning his Yak aircraft. And when I first read my Fly Pro notes and did a little bit of preparation, I thought, oh dear. I don't have anything Russian, can we? But it's uh, an interesting story with this aeroplane, which I'm going to share with you. Based in Belgium, it served with the Ukrainian Air Force, was never in Russian colours, and also served with the Free French Air Force in the Russian campaign against the Luftwaffe in 1943 to 1945. Operation Barbarossa, you might remember. Hitler's failed attempt to invade Russia, seize Moscow, and expand his empire. Ra rather like Napoleon, he was beaten by the weather, had to make a retreat. Six million men were lost in the process. From your left to right along the main crowd line is the Yak 3U, demonstrating its agility and speed. Extremely fast aeroplane for its configuration, as you'll see. The radial engine was fitted, considered less vulnerable from ground fire from the standard engine that it had before. That's the pistons in a line as opposed to the pistons going around in a circle. Remember, the power plant of a fighter aeroplane is very vulnerable. Once it's broken, it's not a lot of use. So imagine we're in Soviet Russia, it's 1943, 44. The Free French Air Force were equipped with these aircraft and took to them. Their kill ratio was 10 to 1 in the Russian campaign against the German aircraft, very easy to outmaneuver them. And this particular aeroplane was found in Egypt and brought back to life by an Israeli businessman, found in Egypt, an Israeli, Israeli businessman rebuilt it, came back to Britain.
and Bob Davey is putting it through its paces for us this afternoon. Radial engine, very common in those days in a lot of aeroplanes, mass produced radial power plant. So my fears were groundless because we have got this Russian designed aeroplane built in Romania with Ukrainian colours giving a display for us this afternoon. snooker to while away the hours and he was very good friends with the Russian snooker champion in off the red till it's getting late huh? Very few of these Jack aircraft in existence today. This one is based in Belgium where it's looked after. Bob picks it up, flies it over for the air show season. problems with identifying fighter aircraft in battle is the similarity, it's being absolutely sure you know what type it is because they do look similar at high speed.
Well, there we are. We've concluded the Yak uh, fly passing demonstration. You can probably hear a lot of noise from a lot of Spitfires all getting ready. The closing event of the first day of the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend is about to commence. It's the Spitfire and Hurricane 9 ship display. We're just going to welcome back Bob Davy in the Act 3. He's just on the final approach, I think. And that added a little bit of uh, diversity to our Fly Pro today to see how the Yak Company put their fighter aircraft together. Interesting to see the varying sizes, comparing it with the Hurricane, which is lining up with the Spitfires now. The war-winning aircraft, a lot to be said for fighting in large numbers with well-equipped, well-trained pilots. We can just see the Yak coming in now. One, no, just one. You see a little bit of forward stick there, just to slow it down. Let it fall back onto the tailwheel. <laughs> and we welcome Bob Davy back to Terra Firma. And as we come to the ultimate uh, part of the show, the nine ship, just about to line up, get in.
Well, there we are, the words, stirring words of Winston Churchill from those dark days of 1940, evoking the spirit of victory. And we are in a unique position this afternoon to enjoy not one, not two, not three, but nine aircraft from the Battle of Britain, including two hurricanes. An absolutely unique formation that we're privileged to present here at Headcorn Aerodrome at the Battle of Britain weekend. Seldom seen, so have those cameras ready. Unfortunately, with the development of restoration in the last, say, 20 years, more and more of these vintage aircraft are coming back to flying condition. There was a period in the 50s and 60s where they were being destroyed and burned and broken up and got rid of as surplus to requirements until people realized that there'd be none left. So huge effort was made to reclaim these wrecks and relics and with engineering skill and expertise rebuild them to flying condition and that is what we're seeing as we close the show here at Headcon on the first day of three the 2022 Battle of Britain celebration celebrating the lives of those who gave their lives sacrifice in those dark days a long time ago Sadly, many younger generations are seeing the outbreak of war once again. We pray for them. There's a magnificent sight just coming round on your right hand side along the runway past the red and white control tower shortly. Have those cameras ready. This is a unique sight. Six aircraft. Just Three Hurricanes, three Spitfires, those great rivals in the Battle of Britain.
unique sight. Three Spitfires, three Hurricanes in a lovely formation with the other Spitfire just on top of it. What a sight. What a sound. black and white footage of King George taking the salute at Buckingham Palace. Very, very similar view to that as the Royal Air Force celebrated its victory over Germany. And what an achievement to recreate that here at Corps today. as the aircraft are formating once again it's my opportunity to thank every one of you for coming to the show today and we all on behalf of the organizers hope you have had a wonderful day with us here at Headcorn and enjoyed all of the aircraft and everything else going on today so let's enjoy this wonderful formation once again Once again, if you have enjoyed the show, please tell your friends. If you haven't, don't say anything. But uh, contact Terra Legends if you fancy a flight to Spitfire or Harvard, Tiger Moth. Absolutely wonderful setup we've got here at Headcorn for your enjoyment. Hopefully, we're seeing some of you again tomorrow and Sunday. privilege to commentate on these events. I look back to my childhood at Biggin Hill in the 1960s, listening to the commentator thinking, oh, I'd love to do that. And it's a real privilege to be able to deliver some comments about the aircraft for you today. Hope you've enjoyed it.
there might be a nervous group captain up on the control tower wondering how many were coming back. This could be the typical arrival after battle. How many have made it? Just try to imagine there, you're in a trench trying to defend some territory, and this lot come up, your guns blazing, browning machine guns, enough to put fear into any soldier. Documented, of course, by many, many films, the best of which probably the Battle of Britain. It's still a very, very good uh, representation of what went on, although it was filmed way back in 1965, still well worth a look. and names like Johnny Johnson, Douglas Bader, all performed in the Battle of Britain in these type of aircraft.
not only the Battle of Britain, but these aircraft served in other theatres of war, the Far East particularly. The war wasn't over until the Japanese had surrendered. Of course, there was a version of the Spitfire called the Seafire, launched from the deck of a carrier, as was the Hurricane. The Russian Air Force had some. They were crated over on the PQ-17 convoys out to Murmansk, crated up. There are rumours that there are some still buried in caves and crates. I'd like to see that, if that is true or not. The Australian Air Force... South African Air Force. They were in use right up until the mid-60s with Air Forces operationally. The Israeli Air Force had several right up to about 1970. The Irish Air Force had a couple of two-seaters as well. They were into tandem teaching in the spit long before anybody else. Who'd have thought? Well, it's gear down and flap set for landing. Throttle back. Get the prop fully fine to slow it down as we watch this fantastic formation return back to Head Corn, the former forward landing ground as it was in 1944 when the American Air Force were based here with the uh, Mustangs and of course the Canadian Air Force with their Hurricanes. This was a very busy place right up until and beyond the D-Day landings as was Staplehurst, Head Corn to the north. Lashen Den, and the, a lot of these lands were sequestered by the Air Ministry because they had the right length and size. And we celebrate to this day the Freeman family who own this land, still celebrate the contribution that the aerodrome made to the war effort. And we're delighted all these years later to present to you this air show. So, in closing, thank you to you all for coming far and wide. If you're driving home, take your car. And um, we hope to see you again. Some are coming to see us for the whole weekend. If not, book early and we'll see you next year. announcement to make is Alexander Beelan still with us. Alexander Beelan, are you still with us? If you are, sir, could you make your way to the commentary position, please, by the red and white air traffic wagon. Alexander Beelan, if you're with us, sir, this is of some importance. Remember, this runway is quite bumpy, you know, it's not always the pilot's fault. Once again, it's a call for Alexander Beelan, if you're still with us, sir. Make your way, please, to the commentary position. Thank you. It's a big thank you to Mike Stanway and his team, our flying display director, for making this all happen. A lot of work goes on behind the scenes before we put a show together. And he does a wonderful job for us every year. It's always a pleasure to see you, and thanks again from and for all your team. 
Thank you to Aero Legends and all the staff. We've got two more to get down, and that does conclude the first of three days here at Head Corn, the Aero Legends Battle of Britain weekend. I'm looking forward to a cold pint of water, flavoured with hops and barley, some of my flying chums here. Talk, tell outrageous lies to each other about flying events we had when we were upside down. Well, there we are, aviation enthusiasts. That concludes our first display day of three. I truly hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And a safe journey home to you all. And we'll maybe see you tomorrow, Sunday, or next year. Thanks again. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Really spectacular afternoon of um, flying there. Uh, you know, that many warbirds in the sky in these kind of uh, lighting conditions and sky. Wonderful afternoon. I hope we haven't detracted, distracted you from uh, work too much today. And um, bear in mind that the weekend show, there is more to come. Uh, that will uh, be available on watch.planesdb.com. So free to view today. It's a subscription service over the weekend, and we're expecting more of the same, a little bit uh, slightly different. No reds over the weekend, but more of the warbird action. So if you'd like to watch that, head over to watch.planestv.com and get subscribed. That service you'll also get give access to our coverage of the Royal International Air Tattoo in just a few weeks' time. Right. Long day. As I said at the start, we're, two men we're one man down today, and really I should have three or four involved so that was a two-man shoot both pretty exhausted so I think I'm going to join the commentator for a nice ice-cold glass of water flavoured with hops and uh, what else did he say molten hops yeah good good idea sounds like a good idea to me right I probably have a video I can show you uh, to say cheerio to it's probably a little bit of uh, coverage from last weekend's Duxford Air Show uh, it's another piece of content that's available on the on-demand service which uh, stretches back 30 years the service that Edgorn's going out on Saturday and Sunday got a massive archive there of aviation action um, I, sh I should really have got some nice archive stuff that I did want to dig out we've shot some material in the early 90s late 80s even at West Malling just down the road here and I thought that would have been nice to include but uh, yeah raving through hard drive uh, hard drives. I was defeated sadly. Well, let's take a look at this though. That's it going to be? Uh, could be Stripe Masters. Could be, it could be NHS Spitfire actually which would be quite nice and fitting. Let's take a look at this clip from uh, Duxford last weekend to uh, play us out prior to uh, the show proper tomorrow and Sunday. Cheers all. Bye bye.
final pass then coming up for the Spitfire PR11. This unarmed photographic reconnaissance variant of the Spitfire with a great history of its own. One that's been considerably added to over these past couple of years with its fundraising activities on behalf of the NHS with thousands of handwritten signatures of donors emblazoned on the aircraft and of course thank you NHS on the undersides. And as the Spitfire completes its